Hello. Hello, class. Welcome back to Philosophy 1301. Uh, we're doing uh, Chapter 13. Today's topic is going to be existentialism. Uh, we're, we just got done with Hegel and Marx. <clears throat> this is all part of 20th century philosophy now. So we're in the 20th century, all right, 1900s now. Uh, well, kind of, except for two people, which is going to be Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. But after that, it's going to be on 1900s, and more or less a little bit more understandable as you read their actual uh, writings, except for Heidegger. But uh, let's begin with what is existentialism. Oh, let's begin with what is it's not. It is not a complete philosophical system, as in like Kant, like Kantian metaphysics or Kantian epistemology, or like Hegel's system of this universal mind uh, becoming more fulfilled as history goes through the dialectic. Right? It's not this whole philosophical system at all. It's really just an approach. It's a world, it's like a view, a perspective into reality, into how we live, experience life. Right? So existentialism is basically the main question is, what is existence? Hence, existentialism. Uh, some of the main questions, uh, well, I guess main themes that uh, these existentialist thinkers share, because they don't share one method of philosophy, right? Or they don't share one system, but they share these like similar questions or similar themes that they're trying to unravel. Uh, some of these themes will be, uh, of course, the individual and subjectivity. So what is being a subject as opposed to an object? So behind me, I see some books, right? So a book is just an object, but me, myself, is a subject. I am experiencing things. I experience the world, whereas this book does not experience the world. Right? It's just matter. It's just material stuff. I am material stuff, too, but I'm something else than that. Right? I am uh, I'm experiencing things. So the individual is subjectivity, right? Uh, so we're not talking about universal generalizations, universal principles. We're talking about the individual. <clears throat> Another theme that we talk about in existentialism is the idea of freedom or the tension between freedom and responsibility. Right? There's, there's, these, there's a big tension there. Right, so existentialism, existentialists will claim that we are condemned to be free, as Sartre uh, says famously. Uh, and John Paul Sartre is one of the most uh, famous existentialists. So Sartre says that we are condemned to be free, that human beings are just radically free. But this radically freedom, this, this radical freedom that we have to uh, to make our own essence also posits within us this incredible amount of responsibility. Everything is on me. It's up to me for everything. Uh, I cannot blame God. I cannot blame my family. I cannot blame social pressures. I could only blame myself if I succeed or fail. That's a lot of responsibility. All right. And this kind of in turns then gives us to our next theme, which is anguish. It's angst that we have once we realize that we're just totally free and alone and facing this world that is totally, this universe, that is totally indifferent to us, that doesn't really give a shit if we succeed or failed. Yet we're trying to make sense of our life. We're trying to give meaning to life. But the universe is just indifferent to that. If I give meaning to my life or not, Flowers will wither and die, and, and the sun is going to go up and down until it explodes. Right? But it doesn't care about me at all. Right? The universe doesn't care about us. right? And this is the, the theme of, of absurdity. How do we make life this paradox? Right? How do we make life meaningful as we face this realization that the whole universe is indifferent to you? This, this is what we call absurdity or the absurd in existentialist uh, philosophy. 
And lastly, uh, I guess, you know, it all seems negative, right? It is, it is kind of negative. These people are writing uh, myths of two world wars, World War One, World War Two. So there is not positive, you know, life is not good, you know. So how do we give meaning to this life? In the face of the absurd, in the face of the fucking Holocaust, in the face of, you know, trash warfare, shit like that. Next is authenticity. This is our next theme, authenticity. What it is to be authentic. All right, again, I will mention Sarge. We'll get to it more, uh, more into detail later. But Sarge uh, talks about bath faith. Bath faith is basically you're being untrue to yourself. You're unfaithful to yourself. That's living in bath faith. Living inauthentically. Uh, what it means is that you're not uh, choosing for yourself your own essence. You're not giving yourself... You're not giving meaning to your own life, you yourself. You're depending on God. You're depending on social pressures, peer pressure, whatever. But you yourself are not choosing life, and that's living in bad faith, and that's not an authentic life. Being authentic is facing up to all this that we just mentioned, facing up to this pure radical freedom, which gives us this responsibility, facing up to this... Uh, anguish that that induces this absurdity of the world around us and still choosing to make life meaningful for us for ourselves for me right that's authenticity more or less right according to these existentialist thinkers all right so let's talk about how where where, where does this come from this existentialism you know, ever since Aristotle, we've been thinking about, you know, it is about life, but we're trying to always, like, create this big theory that we could explain what life is, right? There's empirical approaches to epistemology. There's a rationalist. It's all in your head, right? It's on your mind. Right? You have your cart. Or you have uh, this, this, the thinking ego, right? Cogito ergo sum. And then you have the John Locke, the empiricist, says, no, it's about experience. All right? And then we, we're, we're a tabula rasa, we're a blank slate, and then we experience and we learn. It was different. And these big like, systems of philosophy to make our experiences fit neatly into these principles. Existentialism doesn't do that. It's actually against that. And one of the first people to do this, one of the first, like, I would say, proto existentialist, right, pre-existentialist, he's not a full-blown existentialist, he never used that himself, is uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, Soren Abia Kierkegaard, born 1813-1855, uh, really, really uh, interesting fellow, he, uh, he objected completely to Hegel's uh, whole philosophy, and he was writing at the time when Hegel was the shit, right? Hegel was, Hegel was the, you know, the trend, and he was totally against that. He was like, this is just bullshit, guys. Like, this is, this is utter, complete nonsense. So he objected to the implicit optimism and what he called the swallowing up <clears throat> of contradictions in Hegel's dialectic. All right, he was like, all right, I'm just going to take these contradictions in Hegel's dialectic just for granted, and save this history? Come on, guys. This is more. There's more than that. This is too abstract. Uh, so basically, Kierkegaard claimed that even though Hegel's you know system is powerful, so it's a tour de force. That's the, the word he used. Super powerful to read. Uh, it's a really impressive philosophical piece of work. Nonetheless, it does not relate to the lived existence of the individual. It doesn't give any guidance to what a person should do. What good is it to know about the dialectic? Right? Remember about last lecture? If it doesn't tell us what to do. And this is in his own words here. According to Kierkegaard, this is a young Kierkegaard when he was in 1835. He's probably in his 20s here. He's barely in, his, in the university. Uh, which one? Copenhagen. What I really like is to be clear in my mind what I am to do, 
not what I am to know, except insofar as I am certain understanding must precede every action. The thing is to understand myself, to see what God really wishes me to do. The thing is to find a truth which is true for me, to find the idea for which I can live and die. And then he goes on, what good would it do me what good would it do me if truth stood before me, cold and naked, not caring whether I recognize her or not, and producing in me a shudder of fear rather than a trusting devotion? What is it about me? Why, if I do know all this knowledge, right, and it doesn't really like care about me, like what is it good for? Right? What is this Hegel's big system of philosophy about a dialectic and the universal mind good? If you cannot relate it to everyday life ex lived experience, that's Kierkegaard. This is the beginnings of existentialism. <clears throat> so, Kierkegaard's philosophical quest is to establish what it means to be an individual. He describes his process of self actualization as three stages. And this is just taken from his own life experiences. So the first stage is the aesthetic life, then the ethical life, and then the religious life. He was a really, really religious person. The aesthetic life is just pleasure. In his early years when he was a university student, he was partying. His dad was a really, really rich merchant, and he was just really spoiled. He had money to spend, and he partied a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. He partied. Let me, let me read some of his... Uh, some of his diaries, his journals. I have just returned from a party at which I was the life and soul. Wit poured from my lips. Everyone laughed and admired me, but I went away. And the dash should be as long as the Earth's orbit. Just a big dash, he writes in the journal. Big dash. And I wanted to shoot myself. Right? So even though he's, a, he's, he's living life, right? he's living the aesthetic life, the pleasure, you know, he's admired, he's loved. He still has, there's something empty. There's still something lacking. It's not for, so he uh, kind of goes into like uh, back to school more seriously. And this is like the ethical life of just being about duty, about Kant, the imperatives. But still also, right, there's nothing, there's something lacking there. And then there's finally the religious life. <clears throat> and the religious life, is where one just leaps, one just like, you know what, just like passionately commits to God. And thus, according to Kierkegaard, as soon as you just take this leap of faith, he calls it, you are totally free from meaning, the meaninglessness and dread of the universe. So in the ethical life, you do everything right, what's morally, what's ethical, but then you realize you cannot be as God, like God. God is the most ethical, according to Kierkegaard. He's super religious again, okay? His dad was super religious, his family, Lutherans, right? So in the ethical stage, at least to the point where one realizes that one cannot entirely fulfill the moral law, that one is still sinful in the presence of God, in the presence of God. And only in this religious stage, says Kierkegaard, as you take the sleep of faith and you just suspend judgment, basically, and just believe in God wholeheartedly, you become free of the meaningless, meaninglessness and the dread of life. This notion uh, is basically saying you don't need reason, you don't need philosophy to have faith, to believe in religion, to believe in God. This whole rationalist turn, enlightenment turn, it's, it's, it's getting us out of hand, out of whack. It is called fidez. <clears throat> right. Again, for him, what's important, it's not really truth, objective truth, but the subjective truth, subjectivity, the individual. How should I live? How should I, what should I believe? What is important for me in my life? Not objective truth somewhere out there, but just the everyday 
practical stuff. <clears throat> Another idea of Kierkegaard is that he charges, he, he claims, he challenges society that most society, that society itself, let me put it this way, is stripping, is crushing individuals. Uh, and making them just like robots, basically. Let me say, let me put it in his words: People have forgotten what it means to exist. And we just have all these societal pressures that we forgot what it means to exist. This direct light of our own inner experience has been dimmed. That's what it says here. All right, all right. All right, there we go. We're back. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kierkegaard. Yeah. Pretty cool, man. He's all about the individual passions. We're losing those things. We're losing how to, we're forgetting how to be individuals. We're forgetting how to exist. We're accumulating all this information, all this knowledge that we're forgetting about the passions. Society's plague of conformity and group thinking. This is what he says, and I guess this is the last thing about it. I'll do with Kierkegaard, so you can move on. And his uh, famous book, Either Or. Let others complain that the age, that this age is wicked. My complaint is that it is wretched, for it lacks passion. All right. That's Soren Kierkegaard, pretty much opening up the doors to existentialism, opening up these questions of what it means to be an individual. Oh, allergies. <clears throat> All right. Next guy that we're going to talk about is going to be Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche. He was born in 1844, and he died insane. He went fucking insane, and he died in 1900. Uh, it actually, his father died similarly, also went insane. Back then, they call it the softening of the brain, so your brain softens. At the age of five, his father dies, and he's just uh, with his mom and sisters, just full of females. Anyways, uh, ever since he was a kid, he suffered from migraines, uh, really bad migraines, Nietzsche. Takes a really strong medicine. That would make him uh, really nauseous. So either he was he had headaches, migraines, or he was nauseous <laughs> for the rest of his life until he died. Poor guy. Pretty pretty. F that's kind of sad, right? And for example, in, in 1889, he had a mental breakdown in uh, Turin, Italy, in the middle of the street. What happened is that uh, he was he was just walking around, right? He he pretty much like. Uh, had retired from teaching at this point because of his ailments. His health was really bad now. So he, what he did was just travel around Italy and Switzerland, another part of Italy, and the Swiss Alps and the Italian Alps. And in Turin, he was there one day, and then he saw this guy whipping a horse. It's, it's, a, it's like a car, right? It's like a, a wagon back then. Right? It's just what you see every day. It's like seeing somebody hit their car, basically. This guy freaked the fuck out, fucking Nietzsche. Nietzsche freaked the fuck out, made a scene, fucking cursed out the the driver of the wagon who was whipping the horse, and he hugged the horse and trying to protect the horse. And then since then, he was put into a mental asylum, and he died. The fucking insane. He went batshit crazy. People say that he went batshit crazy because of his philosophy. He just, you know, the way he was thinking, just turned him that way. 
Uh, other more plausible uh, theories out there is that uh, when he was young, he used to love going to, with prostitutes, with whores. So we go to the whorehouse and he developed what people might say is syphilis. And he never went to get a cure. And the later stages of syphilis, that you, your brain could go, you go insane. Right? I don't know what happens exactly with your brain, but it affects your brain. And people believe that's exactly what happened to Nietzsche. So poor guy. Uh, his love life was not that great. Let's put it that. But he was fucking brilliant. All right? He was so brilliant <laughs> that at the age of 24, all right, and keep it keep this in mind, no other philosopher has done this. He got a post. He became professor. He became uh, uh, the chair of uh, philology, of classical philology, which is linguistics now. So classical linguistics at the University of Basel present-day Germany, in 1869 at the age of 24, without having had a dissertation yet, or the Habilitation Shift, which is, in Germany, you have to get a dissertation, or your doctorate, and then you got to write a book, an extra book, to be able to teach at university. Pretty cool. Uh, he didn't do none of those. They just, he was, his professors thought he was so fucking brilliant that, you know what, just give him the fucking job. He's just fucking smart. That's Nietzsche. Uh, so without even uh, writing, or without even an exam, if I know exam per se, uh, the University of Leipzig gave the doctorate. Pretty, pretty bright young fellow. The age of 24. What the fuck was I doing at 24? I wouldn't even say if I was doing 24. Anyways, right? Tragically, at the, at the age, uh, by 1888-89, he's losing his fucking head, his mind. And he dies in 1900. Although he wrote some amazing stuff. There is no specific, again, he's an ex proto existentialist There's no specific system that you could say this is Nietzschean history or whatever, theory or whatever. There's themes that he does come back to a lot throughout his writings. So, so one of his most famous book is uh, Das Bike or Das Spoke Salatrusta, and then The Birth of Tragedy, which I have here, and The Genealogy of Morals. The Birth of Tragedy, as a matter of fact, is his first book he ever wrote. Uh, All right, so that's like a little bit of background of Nietzsche. So let's talk about his actual uh, philosophy. So let's talk about. Let me see. Should I use? Does your textbook? All right. Yeah, let's talk about the birth. Let's start where he begins, right? The birth of tragedy. What is the birth of tragedy? Tragedy. Greek tragedy. It's a Greek place. Old school Greek place. You have Achilles. You have uh, uh, Euripides. You have all these famous Greek playwrights. And he's talking about uh, Greek society, he's analyzing Greek society. And he's, he claims this, similar to Kierkegaard, that we lost our passions. That we lost our passion, we became so rational about shit. How do we lose our passions? Sorry about that. How do we lose our passions? Uh, he breaks it up into two big categories. All right, there is uh, Dionysian. Is the god Dionysus, who is the god of wine and the god of uh, destruction, of just reverie, partying. And then there's Apollonian uh, categories, or ways of life, which is after the god Apollo, which is the god of order, the god of harmony, the god of structure. So to Greek, to, uh, to Nietzsche, sorry, the Greeks had this balance, right? And this could be seen in the Greek tragedies, the Greek playwrights, right, where there is this Dionysian character in it. It's all about just getting fucked up, getting wasted, just destruction, madness. And there's also, at the same time, though, this Apollo, Apollonian character, which is all about order and harmony, and that balances things out. Dionysian and Apollonian. Apollo and Dionysius. He says that Nietzsche claims that in his Birth of Tragedy, that we lost the Dionysius, uh, the Dionysian character within us of life, 
or at least the Greek did, the Greeks did, and then us by extension, because we became so rational, we became so uh, enmeshed with the Apollonian way of living, and this was uh, the fault of Socrates, <laughs> Plato, and then Aristotle. Right? Ever since these philosophers, uh, we've been so in enamored, so uh, obsessed, right, with rationality that we've lost how to deal with our passions. We lost this Dionysian character. And Nietzsche is claiming for, we need to return to that. We need to return to this balance. We need to overcome ourselves and return to this balanced way of life that we totally lost. Okay, so that's the birth of tragedy. Right, Dionysios and Apollo. Pretty cool. There's this, 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 this new synthesis, he says, between these two uh, traits is going to create a new artistic Socrates. Right? Socrates was just too rational. We need an artistic Socrates. And uh, uh, just this way, this is way, way better. And how do we go about this? How do we reach? How do we? How do we become this artistic Socrates? Says Nietzsche, and he goes there. So in order to uh, to face life honestly and, and creatively, to become this creative genius, as as Nietzsche said, we must begin by proclaiming the death of God, by accepting that God is dead. Uh, he wrote this. He wrote this in the, the, the gay science, in the short story called the 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 madman. It's actually in your book. <clears throat> so with the death of God, all values that are somehow dependent externally. So, for example, I don't know. If I want to cheat on the test to get a better grade, according to Nietzsche, right, you, there is no values, there is no external morality, there is no God that's going to tell you that's right or wrong. All we have now is just rationality. Right, we killed God with our rationality. There is uh, there is no God because we killed them. Uh, this is what uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky in his really 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 book called the brothers Karamazov says that uh, in there he, some brothers are talking and Ivan one of the brothers says if God is dead then everything is permanent and that's exactly what Nietzsche is trying to get out of here right now we now we're free <laughs> this is not a negative thing now we're free and we, now we have this possibility to choose either or like going back to Kierkegaard here the individual is free to create and define its own values. Now. now we're free with the death of God. Now we're free to become this creative Socrates. We're not going to depend on either God or on, on Socrates, on these philosophers, to tell me what to do. I want to depend on myself. This Ubermensch, he calls it the Superman. All right, so there's no absolutes. There's no universal values. No absolute values. All these things have collapsed. All we have is the individual making its own choices in life. All right. <clears throat> so according to Nietzsche, uh, all human behavior can be understood in terms of what he calls the will to power. The will to power. It's a really important concept. The will to power is this. Uh, basically, every human behavior can be understood as power relations. The other person who's trying to be an overman, who's trying to be a superman, this overman, who's trying to overcome himself, and self-actualize himself, he's trying to make choices for himself, it's going to come across me. It's going to look at me. 
and he's going to make an object of me. He's going to try to dominate me. Basically, uh, Nietzsche takes a very, uh, some people say an idealistic view of human behavior, that every human is out, to, is out there to dominate whoever he's, he encounters, whether it's nature or another human being. Our, our inner, like, just drive is to dominate each other for the purpose of saving myself, or preserving myself. Uh, to power is the fundamental nature of existence as a drive to control and dominate. This is what life is. It's not this big Cartesian metaphysics or whatever you want to use. It's the will of power. That's what life is, these relationships, these bird dynamics between individuals. That is life. It's based on individual relationships with other people. Let me, let me say uh, what he tells you here. Let me quote you some Nietzsche real quick. This is from Tos Spoke Saratustra. Where I found a living, there I found will to power. And even in the will of those who serve, I found the will to be master. So even on those who serve, there is the will to master. And then remember about Hegel, right? The, the slave-master relationship here. The dialectic there between the slave and the master. He, he's read he, Hegel. And where men make sacrifices and serve and cast amorous glances, there too is the will to be master. And it, life itself confided the secret to me. Behold, it said, I am that which must always overcome itself. Indeed, you call it a will to procreate or to uh, drive to an end or to something higher, farther, more manifold. But all this is one and one secret. My will to power, right, walks also on the hills, on the heels of your will to truth. My will to power walks also on the heels of your will to truth. All right, so this will to power, right, this is what you think is truth. This is the truth. People wanting power, the will to power. Knowledge, snitchy. Is an instrument of power. The reason why we want to know things is to control things. I think about the word understand. Once you understand something, you put it under a, you're, you're standing at something underneath something. It's understanding something. You're, you're, you're the stand, basically. You're understanding something. You put it under you. It's to understand. You control it. You could put it wherever you want. Knowledge is the instrument of power. This is Nietzsche. And this is why uh, the Nazis were super, super fans of Nietzsche and use his philosophy, especially this world to power and the, the whole the, his whole notion of the Ubermensch, the Superman, to justify their uh, atrocities. Right? If Nietzsche was around when the Nazis, what Nazis were. He would have been horrified by the Nazis. This is not what he's trying to get at. What he's trying to get at is that it's that there's other people that have the will to power as well. So this is about it's about individual wills and the power to ex express those wills that makes up life. That's it. He's, he's about life. Nietzsche is all about life. He's not a nihilist. People say he's a nihilist that he's all about like you know killing life and stuff. Basically, that life is. Absurd. It's quite the opposite. He's trying to find meaning in life. And the way he finds it is with this, through this will to power, this overmatch, right? and this Dionysian Apollonian uh, synthesis. All right, let's move on to the next guy, which is Martin Heidegger. No, you got three more. And Martin Heidegger. This motherfucker was a Nazi bastard. Totally bought into the fucking Kool-Aid of Nazism. Uh, he was a writer of Freiburg. He was appointed by Hitler. He was a, he was a promoter of Hitler. Fanatic of Hitler. 
all the way up to 1945, until there was no more uh, Nazi party, he was a subscriber to like the party uh, paying dues and shit. Nonetheless, Martin Heidegger is perhaps one of the most important 20th century philosophers. He is the one that began this whole movement of existentialism, ironically. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to get past the fact that he was a Nazi bastard, but we cannot deny his incredible impact on modern philosophy. All modern existentialists trace back their beginnings with Heidegger. Some people argue that he just did it because he didn't want to die. Right? He was kind of forced into being the Nazi. He just kind of went along with it. But that's kind of hard to to defend now. You know, we have his journals. We have, you know, he's, he's a Nazi. He's a Nazi bastard. Smart guy. A fucking Nazi. All right, let's see what about him. Let's, let's give you a little bit about him. Besides him being a Nazi, Martin Heidegger. I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing anything this. Oh, these guys are German thus far. It's continental philosophy here. Uh, so he studied philosophy at the University of Freiburg. Uh, he was born a Catholic, raised a Catholic, then transformed into a Lutheran, whatever. So he was uh, trained as a Jews Jesuit, and the Jesuits are known for like their very, very rigorous training in the classics. And that's really the basis of all Martin Heidegger's philosophy, where he gets his influence from, is the classics, the, the, the classical uh, philosophers, talking about you know, the pre-Socratics, and Socrates, I wrote all those people. Uh, so he studied philosophy at Freiburg uh, after he decided not to be a Jesuit no more. There he uh, studied under and was a TA, the teaching assistant for this guy, Edmund Hersero. I wish I had more time here. Now. Edmund Herzl, he's the one that uh, comes up with the idea of well, the method of phenomenology. Phenomenology is just a study of direct sense experience, direct, direct experience. It's just a study of phenomena as it hits you, without any positions. I won't get into it because it's kind of hard, but I put up some readings, if you want to know, of Herzl. Very interesting philosophy here. Anyways, he met him, he, he was totally adopted the phenomenological approach uh, to his own philosophy. This is Heidegger, you know? Uh, in 1923, he wrote his Magnus Opus, Being in Time. Uh, again, perhaps the most important book in 20th century philosophy. Recommend you take a look at it. Super hard to read, not gonna lie. Uh, doesn't make sense at times. <laughs> because he creates his own words. He modifies everyday regular German words and creates his own words to fit his own uh, purposes. For example, Dasein, Dasein, that there, he, that speaks us, human beings, Dasein. And I'll explain that real quick right now. Uh, <clears throat> so he meets Hersero, it's really important to know. Uh, his whole point. His whole, Martin Heidegger's whole point is on the question of being. What does it mean to be? What is being? And this was called being in time. Sign sight. <clears throat> so according to Heidegger, the, the, the Socratics, all these classical uh, philosophers that I just, you know, talked about his influence, had understood they had understood this, right? They had understood this question of being. That was their main question of being. But subsequent Western thinkers had forgotten about being itself by focusing too intently on individual beings. So we forgot about the, the concept, the process, the experience of being because we're focused too much on individual beings. Right? Right? <laughs> All right, so let me try to explain this better. All right, so I'm gonna use an example here. 
So there is a, okay, there's a water bottle here, right? And it's already, it's kind of like, I don't know, it exists. It's existing. It's a being, it's, it's a thing, right? And it's, but it's used though, right? And that's it. We make it. It's a thing, it's a being. But what makes it be, right? So what makes it be is that we, it's, it was in a factory, it comes from the earth, from water, whatever. And so there's like, this is, this is a difference between the question of being, the question of what it is to be, we've lost it. I hope that makes sense, yeah. Let's see if I can get somewhere else here. Basically, to put it another way, is what is it for something to be? So it's not about the properties, right? The the, the constitution of things. It's about what what is being. What is that verb? In, in like the first like forty pages, he's all about talking about the verb to be, right? What is this? And we lost our capability or our focus. On to question that verb, to question what it is to, to begin with. I don't want. I mean, I don't want to know what a cup is or what a bottle is. Right? We already know what it is, right? It's plastic. Right? Uh, Should be using plastic. It's plastic. It's, it's liquid. It's H2O. We know this stuff. We know the properties. But what I want to know, it says Heidegger, is what makes it be, what makes it exist. Okay. Do you guys see that distinction? I hope so. I really, really hope so. Right. This is what he calls the pure existence of things. And this is what phenomenology tries to uncover. Right. The thing itself. When things exist. Not the properties. Not what it is. Not what it does. But what is, is. Makes it be. This is a really hard ontological concept here. It's about the ontology of things. What makes it be? Not how an object exists or what it is, but existence itself. What is existence itself? This is Heidegger. That's why he's so important. Right? He completely changes our focus on where we should ask our questions. Let me, let me uh, read you some Heidegger here. In each use of a verb, we have already thought and have always in some ways understood being. We understand immediately. Today is Saturday. The sun is up. We understand that is we use in speaking. Although we do not comprehend it conceptually, the meaning of this is remains close to us. If philosophy is the science of being, then the first and last and basic problem of philosophy would be what does being signify? What is being? To gain some understanding of being, Heidegger suggests that we examine the one being with which we are intimately acquainted with, human beings, the Dasein. <clears throat> so this phenomenological method that he adopts from Herzl, which is supposed to unravel or unconceal, as Herzl says, the data experience how? By allowing this data experience to show itself. We're not going to judge anything. We're not going to make any presuppositions. We're just going to try to get to the things themselves. This is like the famous quote of Herschel, to the things themselves. This is phenomenology. All right? This method will then allow us to examine the self. And then via this phenomenal, phenomenological method, uh, method, this existential phenomenology, as it becomes known, one discovers oneself as a dying, as a dasein, as a being in the world, as being there. Right? So dasein is a really important concept here. Dasein. And let me uh, gotta write this for y'all.
D-A-S-E-I-N, Dasein, being there. So first of all, humans, human beings, we're just thrown in the world. Or we're just... We're just thrown in the world. Or we, don't, we don't have no question. We have no choice of what birthday it was for us, what parents. If I, I'm an American citizen, right? I'm a U.S. citizen. I didn't choose that. I was just thrown here, right? We're just thrown in the world. But that's the first kind of like characteristic of Dasein. Just thrownness, being in the world. Right? Dasein is not something that exists independently, right? Like the, the cogito for Descartes. Right? We don't just... In the, our mind doesn't exist out there somewhere, right? Or later. No, we're in the world. We're in the world. We actively are illuminating the world around us. Lichtung. Right? I think that's what he uses. Think about like a, a forest, a really thick forest. There's a clearing in the forest. And then you're in the forest, and right? there's a lot of trees, and it's really dark because you can't see the sun because of the trees. And then all of a sudden there's a clearing. It's clear. And you see trees and birds. The sun. That's us. That's Dasein. Right? The whole universe, the whole experience is just clouded. Right? It's like a big forest. And then us. And then as we turn around, we, we eliminate things. Lick them. Eliminate, eliminating the clearing of the forest. Like, I can't pronounce it. I'm sorry. <clears throat> All right, so being in the world. This Dasein is not something that exists independently of the universe. So we're involved right, in the world. Every day we make actions, our actions, projections, our projects. Every project we take, going to school, going to work, washing our hands. Every project we take on, every projection, right, we project onto the world. But we're involved very much right, with this world that we're thrown into. Because we, and then we care about this world. We care about our parents. We care about the land that we were born in. Right? Sorge. Sorgen. Something like that in German. This is also part of what makes Dasein. And because we care, <laughs> Dasein is, uh, and this is quote unquote with, with uh, Heidegger, in its very being, that being is an issue for it. That is, Dasein is aware of being. We are aware of this, right, because of these characteristics. We were aware of being thrown in the world. We were aware that we are in the world and involved in it with these projections. And we are aware that we're going to die soon, too, as well, right? Uh, what he calls, let me see, let me bust it out real quick. Falling, the fallenness of Dasein, we're fallen. Right, so we have thrownness, Jevorofenheit, I hope I pronounced that right, projection, and fallenness. So we're thrown in the world. We're thrown in the world. We have these projects, we project, we're involved in the world, and then we decay. We're limited beings, we're finite beings. So this is the, kind of like the three kind of main characteristics of Dasein, and this is what makes our individuality. This is what makes us choose stuff, right? This is what, uh, what being is, what Dasein is. So human existence, says Heidegger, is not to be asked the way one understands the existence of rocks or planets. But in, a, but in the special ways of anticipation of and decision of possibilities. Right? We're always projecting our life towards something, towards the future, or even towards the past. Right? This is because that's why it's being in time. Time is so essential for our existence. This is what makes our existence meaningful, that we are projecting towards some kind of go, or to some kind of, or running away from some kind of past, or trying to go back to some kind of past. And then we're always here in the present. Right. <clears throat> so time, past, present, and future is super, super important for Heidegger as well. Right. Temporality. Right. Tem tempo. Right. Tempo. Being and time. So 
<clears throat> as we conf as a self, this Dasein confronts its own choices. It especially recognizes that with death. Right? Being in the world eventually becomes no longer being there. Right? This, be this becomes really obvious when we were really kids. Right? When we lose a dog or when we lose a loved one. Right? We're like, wow, there's this. There's death. It makes me angst because I'm aware of this. But where I exist, and part of my existence is dying. This is an issue for me, <laughs> says Heidegger. So this awareness of Dasein as being towards death is filled with angst. It is part of Kierkegaard as well. So uh, Heidegger says that the self is always trying to avoid this angst, just this being towards death. And by losing the I, we go and find comfort with the they, the crowd, because we're afraid of this angst, of this awareness of being unto death. So we find comfort with the day and those become inauthentic. We don't live authentically. What we should do is confront this angst because that's what makes us human and makes choices for myself, for the I. And not carry, not really uh, find comfort in the day, but find comfort in, within that angst that is essential for my own Dasein, for my own being here. This, he says, is freedom. This could give us freedom, confronting this angst. All right, so this is Heidegger, this is Martin Heidegger. Let's go into Sartre and Camus. Now, finally, existentialism itself. <laughs> uh, so before, these people were just kind of setting up existentialism for us, and now this is existentialism proper. And this is just two of them. There's a whole, a whole bunch of them. More of this, but we'll just focus on two of them, uh, the two most famous ones and accessible ones. Definitely, Arbor Camus is the most accessible one. He never called himself an existential philosopher. He was a writer. He was always really cool, smoking cigarettes in Paris, the rain, a lot of girls, lovers, and shit. fast cars. Actually, he died. Camus died in a car crash because he was hauling ass. Anyways, let's talk about Sarge. Sarge first. Jean Paul Sarge. So, John Paul Sartre was fucking cool, <laughs> honestly. But anyways, he takes up where Heidegger left off. He was both a student of Heidegger and Husserl. Late, Husserl was already old. But he was a student of, Her of Heidegger and Husserl, he met him. And he was also incorporated Hegel into his theories, into his thinking. He was born in 1905 and he died in 1980. Sartre, when he died, it was like a rock star that died. It's about 50,000 people that followed his procession towards the funeral in Paris. You know, back then, you know, philosophers were like rock stars. Now we care more about fucking Kylie Jenner and the Kanye's or whatever. Anyways, Sarge, rock star. His greatest work is being in nothingness, being and nothingness. And you know, all taken up from Heidegger, right? Um, his central theme about his whole philosophy is the freedom of the individual. And I, I said from the beginning of this uh, lecture that he claims that we are radically free, that we are condemned <laughs> to be free. Not a choice. We are condemned to be free. Right? Humans, he says, are profoundly free to create their own lives, and thus we are entirely responsible for our own lives. For the meaning and for the moral relevance that we give our own life, that is up to us. Not to some external force, pressure, or whatever. It's not up to society or God. Sartre is an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. All right, so he takes up also where Nietzsche left off, that God is indeed dead. Does that mean you, you can't have religious beliefs? It's just that whatever you make your life meaningful should be, ba be based on your individual self and not on something that's a cop out. These existentialists, existentialist thinkers say. Uh, all right. Uh, so being in nothingness, one of his most important works. Nausea, also a really important book about him. So just you know. So, anyways. Uh, According to Sartre, there are two categories for me, 
or existence. The first one is being in itself, and the other one is being for itself. Être en soi, être pour soi. For being in itself and being for itself. Being in itself, the first one, être en soi, is complete in itself. It's solid, it's fixed, it's totally given to you. As he says, uncreated without reason for being without connection with any other being. Being in itself is superfluous for our eternity, says Sarge. One, the, this being in itself is, is simply just is. It just exists in itself. Being in itself. This is like rocks and trees. So this being in itself has no sufficient reason for being. It's just it just is, simply is. No purpose, no meaning. It is that he calls claims absurd. Says Sarge. This being in itself, entre en soi, entre pour soi, for itself, being for itself. This, this other being, on the other hand, is incomplete. It is fluid. And without a determined structure. It's really important. It's not determined. It is fluid. This being for itself. Being for itself is the being of human consciousness. At every moment is freely choosing its future. This consciousness arises by virtue of its power of negation. This is totally Hegel here. Right? Hegel is about the dialectic about the power of negating the thesis. And this is synthesis let me uh, I guess quote some more starch here consciousness this being constitutes itself in its own flesh as the annihilation of a possibility which another human reality projects as its possibility for that reason it must rise in the world as a not so individual consciousness but it is, is it creates itself, it constitutes itself, he says here, by freely rejecting all roles that others try to force it upon it. He says, consciousness constitutes itself in its own flesh as the annihilation of a possibility which another human reality projects as its possibility. So there's possibilities out there, right? This is Heidegger again now, right? There's projections. There's, poly, there's a possibility of projection. I'm going to project my own product, right? It's a possibility of me going to school and getting the degree. Why? Why is that important? Because somebody else said that? Because somebody put that, projected that reality onto me? Or because I chose that myself? This is what Sarge is telling you to confront. Face on. Why are you doing shit that you're doing? Because somebody fucking told you, because you are doing it for your own sake, for your own self-individual constitution, creation, self-actualization. Are you being a sheep or are you being your own self? Are you being authentic or you're not? This is the main question of existentialism, for Sarge at least. So individual consciousness, right, it's this, this no, this act of saying no, and I'm going to do this for myself. <clears throat> All right. I am free to choose my values without any external justification. I am free to choose without having to justify myself to anybody or anyone. This is what living free is. This is what living in good faith is. It's authenticity. So this freedom is not complete, though, says Sarge. We are human beings. We are social beings. There's society out there, though. Right, let's, let's, take account, let's take into account other human beings that are also trying to project their own self-actualization for themselves, trying to act for their own choices. So what happens there? Right? <clears throat> so although this freedom is complete, it is not absolute. It's freedom of choice. Says. In the first place, as a free being, I encounter other free beings. My world is interrupted when the other, this other, Gives me the look, the gaze, the gaze of the other. 
By looking at me, the other objectifies me, makes me into an object, okay? Makes me part of his or her world, of his own little reality that he's trying to project into possibility. I become an object into that world when somebody looks at me, puts her gaze on me. When the other has the gaze on me, I become objective. Okay? This is also Hegel, the master-slave dialectic. Thus, being seen constitutes me as being without defenses for a freedom which is not my freedom. But I can regain my freedom by looking back and by an act of will transforming the other into an object for me. As he says, basically, hell is other people. <laughs> We're always objectifying each other. Right? That's what's going on here. Right? Think about the will to power with Nietzsche. Right? Take it a step further here. So even though this is effect of life, effecticity, this is what makes life this the struggle here, I cannot get away from it, right? I cannot go around it, you know? but I'm still free though. I can still create meaning in this. I am free to create meaning of this. And by, and by creating meaning, I create existence. So subjectivity must be the starting point. Existence precedes essence. So whatever somebody tries to put my essence, my essence means what is my nature, my definition, what makes me me. Right? A lot of people believe, like think about Aquinas, that God gave us, right? Aquinas is the natural law theory, that God gave us right, this teleology, this definition of human. We've got to follow God's law. Uh, Aristotle was about like the substances, right? little forms and shit like that. Uh, Plato was about two different worlds, where right? we gotta get to the world of the forms. Right? These people are existentialists like, no, 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 there's no essence like that. We make our essence as we live every single day. Every single action, every single free choice that we make creates my definition, makes me me. Essence precedes I mean, existence precedes essence. Existence precedes essence. First I exist, and then I'm, I'm free to choose what my essence is, what I am. Subjectivity must be the starting point. All right, let's move on to uh, Camus, Albert Camus. Uh, his main central existentialist theme is the absurd. Um, Camus... Um, also friends with uh, Sartre, uh, he was around that in Paris, stuff really, really popping in Paris at this time period. Even though the World War II was happening, she was in the fan. He was actually, Camus was born in Algiers, which is an African colony of France back then. Uh, he's actually the first African to get the Nobel Prize in literature right, in 1856. Hooray for him. Uh, he was born in Algiers. He was a supporter of the Algiers independence movement, so he was a leftist. Also a moderate, he changed, basically. It's one of his uh, good uh, uh, qualities of Camus is that he didn't stick to his guns, that he adopted, right? Most philosophers, unfortunately, uh, create, with a, create a system of philosophy, a way of thinking, and if it proves to be wrong, the world proves it to be wrong, just stick to it. Like, no, no, no. Right? This guy's like, no, no. Oh, I was wrong. It would change his mentality. It's a really good quality, right there that he has. Uh, he was part of the French Resistance when Nazi uh, occupied Paris, and France. Okay, so he's, he's a badass. He was, right? And again, he, like I said, he was super cool guy, right? I mean, you just look up pictures of Camus. It's always like with his like, just looking pretty badass with a cigarette, you know. Anyways. His central theme is about absurd. What is the absurd? So according to Camus and to most existentialists that we read so far, there's just us, me, us, and you, right, individuals, and the cold, silent cosmos, which cares nothing about us. Doesn't care about our needs or desires, right? The universe doesn't give a shit about us. And this is what absurdity is. 
absurdity because I'm trying to make sense of my life. I'm trying to make, I'm trying to find the meaning of life. This is what philosophy is all about. What is life all about? Yet, <laughs> if you look at it, the universe doesn't go fuck about life, right? Or about my life at least, or your life. So this paradox, right, is this just absurd, right? This absurdity. And how do we overcome this? So do we just like give up, like ah, oh, it, you know, just drink more wine and just hope for the best? No, says Camus, and says the existentialist. No, 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 face this absurdity up front and own it briefly. Own the fact that the world and the universe doesn't give a fuck about our needs and our desires. Let's try to find some meaning in it anyways. Uh, so this, so in order to find meaning in this life amidst this absurdity, where we get no answers, it's just an ending, it's just death, that's for certain, right? Think about Heidegger here. The responsibility of self-definition is what's going to give us this life, meaning. How do we define ourselves? I think about Sartre right now, Sartre. The self-definition, right? it's a big responsibility. We have to live authentically to actualize this self-definition of us, to give myself my own essence. Those who do accept that responsibility and that free recognize that we're alone to make that self-definition of us, to constitute consciousness itself, Sartre said. But those who allow society, religion, history, mass culture, philosophy even, uh, or their own fear to define who they are, these people are living in bad faith. These people are not living authentically. Okay? It's all about living authentically here, about existing as you yourself want to. Uh, the best way to uh, capture Camus, uh, I guess, notion of the absurd is by this uh, myth of Sisyphus. Well, so the myth of Sisyphus is this uh, mythical creature, Sisyphus, back in the Greek gods stuff. And he's forced by the Greek gods to repeat a point task over and over again, which is he's going to push a boulder up this mountain, up this hill. And once he gets to the almost to the top of the mountain and push the boulder over, it always falls down. All the way down, and you got to do it over and over again. He never, he's never going to reach the top of the mountain. He's always going to push that fucking boulder up. That's his punishment for Sisyphus. I forgot what he did exactly. That's a, that's a punishment. Sounds terrible, right? This is also what Nietzsche would call the eternal return. The idea of the eternal return. If this was your life, if you knew your life was going to be, if you, knew your, if you knew your life from end to start, and you knew exactly what's going to happen, and you had the choice to live it eternally, again and again and again, will you still choose it? We still choose to leave eternally, even though you cannot change anything. This is the idea of the eternal return. This is the idea of Sisyphus here, the myth of Sisyphus. If eternally you're going to be pushing this rock up the mountain and never reach it, never reach that goal you have, will you still be? Will you still make meaning? Will you still find this life meaningful? This is the question here. Right? Camus says we have to. This is what the existentialists would do. We have to find meaningful. Meaningfulness and the absurd. Sisyphus still, right? As as uh, as he ends, ends the the story here. One must imagine Sisyphus happy. Right. Happiness and the absurd, says Camus, are the same thing. The sons of the same earth, they are inseparable. So Sisyphus' joy, is silent joy, right? It's silent, you can't really see it. Is is right there, container in his eternal struggle of pushing that rock. Sisyphus, right? Think about us, right? We're gonna push pushing this rock. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor of life. We're always gonna be pushing, 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 and we're never gonna get there, right? Fuck. Doesn't matter. The road, right? The the rock itself, the 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 birds maybe that are passing by. We push this rock, the, the the grass, the hill, the, the boulder itself, the sweat. That I should find. I should find meaning in life in those little things, not in the trying to find the big 
price. This is kaboom. All right, guys. This is it. I, I find existentialism fucking beautiful. I think it's a good way to live life. There are some very uh, strong critiques, right? Especially the other. Are we actually free? Right? Am I actually so radically free to choose my own life? Or do I have to follow rules? Or do I have to follow expectations and stuff, right? That's one of the main critiques. It's too idealistic, right? But this is existentialism. Uh, I'm kind of going to skip on pragmatism. I'm just quickly going to mention that pragmatism is... American philosophy is the first full-born American philosophy. There's two people, uh, Peirce, I forgot his first name, and then there's William James. Basically what pragmatism is, is that whatever is right, whatever is truth, don't worry about that either. Worry about what is beneficial, what is more pragmatic to you, what's going to benefit you. That's what we should worry about. That's what philosophy should be worrying about. Not about finding this universal principles or any other stuff. It's just about pragmatics. That's why it's called pragmatism. I don't think I should say anything else about pragmatism. That's pretty much it. All right. I strongly suggest you take a look at the chapter, though. It's really, really interesting. But, yeah. All right, guys. You guys stay safe. Uh, I will I'm gonna upload uh, perhaps just the last chapter I'm going to do for this for this uh, class, which will be chapter 16. Actually, I'm going to combine 16 and 17. I will upload that on Sunday, the lecture for that. Okay? All right, thank you.